now, an eighth special presentation. This time on Art Beat Nation. Gothic stained glass breaks into the 21st century. I take those same techniques and I just use them in a way that I find interesting. We see the world in 360 degrees. A little planet is a way to view one location where everything is focused on that one location. Take a sip of a new brew from an age-old recipe. So you can come up with a creation, really, what is what it is, that's unique to your brewery. Meet a local Lego artist. And I enjoy making square things into round things. It's all ahead on this edition of Artbeat Nation. Funding for Artbeat Nation is made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you. In our first segment, we travel to Milwaukee, Wisconsin to sit down with artist Melissa Janda. The tradition of stained glass may span the centuries, but Janda's work is very much a product of our time. I really am attracted to detail, so line work and shading and um, pure color are, are what really, really uh, inspires me with glass art. My name is Melissa Janda and I am a stained glass artist. I always was drawing as a child, so I've always been interested in art. It's been 20 years since I left art school and I've been doing it ever since. Typically when people think of painted glass, that's generally what they think of, you know, all the church windows that you see. And uh, so I really try to incorporate, uh, I, I take those same techniques and I just use them in a way that I find interesting. Stained glass can be a, can be a difficult medium. There's a lot of different things about it that uh, you that really take a lot of practice. Every step along the way is, is, a, is another part of the craft. It's really a medium like no other because of the light, because it requires light to pass through it in order to view it. And you can change it in, in so many different ways with paint, with color, with texture, with density of glass. One piece can look different at eight different times of the day or season, and I am eternally fascinated by that, by the light. The difference between traditional stained glass and what I do as an artist is, uh, that's hard to say because it's, um, it's really steeped in tradition, which is one of the things that I like about it. The painting on glass is another form of expression, and what I do can be the same techniques, but a more modern interpretation. You're, you're relying on the light to pass through it, and so you're, you have to be constantly aware of how that's gonna change things. You can't just keep applying things and changing things like you would with, with oil paints. And also, you're relying on firing it. You have, to, you have to fire it in a kiln to get the paint uh, to be a permanent surface of the glass, and so you're building up layers of values and texture. When you're painting something, knowing not just how it, how it looks in front of you now, but how that's going to translate into the actual window. So you, you kind of have to account for that. I guess I would compare it more to um, like a watercolor or even printmaking. It's, uh, it can be a very different process than typical canvas painting.
The piece I'm currently working on now is a commission for a residence. They have an older house, but they are also interested in a more modern design. So that makes it kind of interesting because I also like that too, the tradition and the, and the modern kind of all together. They chose animals as their subject matter. And so there's three kids and uh, the parents and they all chose their own animal that they felt uh, reflected them the most. And it's going to go uh, in two side panels that go alongside uh, some French doors in their house. Here we have a scaled version of the design. This is the set of doors and then the two side panels. I start by doing sketches. They're generally a, a scaled down version. It'll be exact proportions of the space, but a, a small scale version. Get the design worked out. And then after the sketches are done in color, then I'll do a full size drawing. And uh, I need to have that. If there's artwork in the painting, then I, that I work out everything full size. And then I can also transfer that into patterns for cutting the glass. Once I have patterns, the pattern shows me uh, the shape that the piece of glass has to be and also the color of the glass. And I cut the glass around the pattern. And uh, once that's all finished, then I paint the glass and uh, fire the glass into a kiln. And, and then once the whole painting process is finished, then I fabricate the window. I use the same drawing, the, I, I transfer that drawing onto another uh, layer of paper that I can use to form the glass around the lead. Well, leading the window can be complicated depending on the design, and uh, that basically involves uh, taking a lead channel and forming it around the glass and cutting it to fit. Then all the joints have to be soldered together. That holds the whole window together. And then once that happens, there's also a puttying process where you're, you take a glazing compound and you press it in between so it encloses all of the spaces between the glass and the lead and it takes away all those little reflections that you might get. And then basically the window is complete. It can take a pretty long time to do it all from beginning to end. Of course, it depends on how large the windows are or how many pieces there are. It's definitely a long process. There's still always that wow factor of um, seeing it really come to life. Some of my favorite pieces are just the really little things that I do that are almost like sketches. I really like to do figure drawings. Sometimes I'll just take old figure drawings out of my sketchbooks and I'll use them and just incorporate them into glass and sometimes just those little pieces bring me a lot of happiness. Sometimes even as much as, as the large production pieces. Glass really changes a space a lot, as, as a lot of art does. And so uh, that's, it's kind of nice being in the business of enhancing spaces because most people are always happy when, when you make something look good. And I really hope that other people see that as well. For more information, visit SadlerGallery.net. Everything may be bigger in Texas, but for Houston-based photographer Sid Moen, who specializes in wide-angle photography, it's all about making the world into little planets. My name is Sid Moen, and I'm a Houston photographer. I saw a little planet about four years ago on the internet and I thought I can do that and I found it very interesting. I've always been intrigued with um, s the spatial aspect of spherical photography. VR photography is virtual reality photography. So if you've ever gone to Google Maps and looked at a street view and where you can pan around and see 360 degrees around um, that block, that's VR photography. A stereographic projection is a mapping term, and that's how a 3D sphere is mapped 2D. But you see a globe, you know, the Earth, that you can kind of turn. Okay, that's a 3D thing. 
but you can also see uh, maps of the world that are 2D, and that would be a stereographic projection. I take 30 photographs, so I take a picture, picture, picture. So it's 360 degrees all the way around, and I get all the sky and all the ground. Uh, then I take it into the computer and I stitch the image together. Um, there are a lot of seams, so there's a bit of time in that. And then I use mapping software to help me get the little planet view. A 360 degree panorama is a spherical image and you can see the 3D aspect on a computer, but a little planet is the same image, only it's mapped 2D. That's the way you see all the whole image around you. What I like about little planets, it's not like a traditional panorama where you're kind of looking like this. It's all in front of you, and uh, I, th I think that's what attracts me to it. And it's different. I like, I like that it's different. It's a little surrealistic, and I like that. And I'm always surprised at people who, who can say, oh, I know that. I mean, it's like I said, well, you get an A+, because you named all the locations. Because sometimes, I think some of them are a little obscure. I think what first attracts people is uh, whether it's an iconic image, let's say like the River Oaks Theater, which everybody loves that one. And I, w I want you to look at that and you know, I just want to attract you to my art first. Uh, and usually that's what it is, it'll be some iconic image that people know or you know, resonates with them. But once they get into it, then they start kind of looking around and you'll see people kind of turn in their head, you know, because they're kind of looking around and, and they're going, oh, oh, there's that shop there, you know, there's that. So you do kind of connect to a place, um, even though it may not be the big fancy place, it's the little place that you see. Well, my favorite one is the shrimp boats. It was taken down in Galveston where the shrimp boats come in. I can't get the view now because there's a building, but it was a spectacular sky, and I love being down by the water, and I think, you know, working people are interesting too. Little planets, it's kind of the idea that the world revolves around me, and a little planet is a way to view one location where everything is focused on that one location and you can see all around it, but maybe you're focusing a little bit more on one part. Um, and it's just kind of a celebration of place. To learn more, visit SidMowen.com. In our next segment, we tour the Atwater Brewery in Detroit, Michigan, where we learn the art of brewing. With dozens of grains to choose from, the possibilities are endless, a prospect Atwater and its customers are quite pleased about. and beer is individual and that's why there's so many breweries in the, in the state of Michigan over 110 and and customers love that too so each individual brewery has their own story you know has their own beers that they make and uh, that that's the true art of it because th there isn't one beer that's alike it's something that people will go out of their way to purchase or to try breweries have become um, destinations, travel destinations for people. People will go out of their way to find beer at the source. Yeah, I would compare brewing kind of like being a chef where you have all these different ingredients 
available and you want to find the right combination to make a beer just the way you want it and then it's also very rewarding when you make a beer that you like and you find out all these other people like it too. No one started with 100 barrel tanks like 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 places are moving into now. It all started very small and very um, again hands-on is, uh, is the best way to describe it. So you've got your uh, palette of ingredients and you've got your equipment and you're blending it together in, in a unique way to create a unique product. I think it's what separates craft beers from like the huge mega brewers is the fact that the, the mega brewers are just making you know very light plain beer that you know appeals to just about anyone like you, it's hard to dislike one of those big beers because there's not a whole lot of flavor to it and people who like craft beer are looking for something more so we have different types of grain that we use that make it darker or roastier uh, we have different hops you can add a whole lot of hops make it hoppier um, you get more and more getting into like sour beers like Belgian style beers that are made in the US so all these different things that have very distinct flavors that aren't for everyone, uh, but they're more of like a, a gourmet product, really. We could easily uh, just make vanilla java porter and dirty blonde and, and do nothing else and probably still sometimes struggle with meeting the demand. But as you know, everybody likes, as an artist and, as, and in that realm, you always like to Spread your wings a little bit, a little bit, and just and see what else you can do. You want to, you want to test your own limits, test your the limits of your equipment, and it allows us to have a little bit of fun. Get all these different ingredients you can mix together in different combinations, give you different results, and you can just play with things from there and alter things. You know, you can come up with a, a simple beer and then come up with variations of that beer. I mean, it's you know, it's endless how far you can go with it dozens of types of grains and hops and processes you can use and uh, different strains of yeast and you have to learn them all and figure out which which of these will give you the flavor that you're looking for so that you can come up with a creation really what is what it is that's unique to your brewery. We really kind of cover all the bases. We have approximately 30 approximately 30 different labels that we produce, whether it be all year round, occasional single batch production or seasonal, uh, seasonal production. It's nice to make something that people appreciate and people really enjoy. Like when people really like one of our beers, they become big fans of it. It's not just something that's convenient or cheap or they're buying it because they really like it. And we're still doing things where we grab the 50 pound bag of malted barley and we're putting it into the mill to grind it and you know it takes at least 17 of those to make a batch and sometimes more uh, and we're throwing in the hops right into the pot just you know just by hand everything's kind of by hand so uh, it's different than like I've done tours of some of the huger breweries in this country and you hardly see any people there you I mean you might see as many people in one of those as you see in one of these small breweries uh, because everything's automated here you know everything's kind of done by hand even the bottling part of it it's loaded and unloaded by hand and i think that's the big difference i think there's lately a lot of pride in detroit in the city that's taken a beating over the last few years but everyone i think is starting to stand up and say this really is a great city a great old town and it really gives you, I think it means a lot to people throughout the Detroit area and throughout the state that this is made right in the city of Detroit. One of our slogans is, is we, we're bringing Detroit everywhere and uh, it's showing and uh, the Detroit name does very well. You know, we're gritty, we're resourceful, we're blue collar, we're hard workers, we like to have a great time. So it's, it's very rewarding. I like it when I sit down at the bar at the end of the day or take home a bottle and I, like we just had our blueberry cobbler beer and I 
took one gulp of that and I knew it was just right on. It was just like dessert in a bottle. So it's always a satisfying thing. You know, I guess I suppose it's true for whatever you do. If you're working on something and you complete it and you know it's good, it makes you feel good. This is more than just a homebrew. This is something that you can go to any store and people talk to me about beers. People all around Detroit have heard of it and tell me they love the beers and it feels good to, to say, yeah, I made that. We know we've gotten it right when, uh, when we need to make more <laughs> and we can't make enough. For more, visit atwaterbeer.com. Phoenix artist Dave Shaddix uses Lego bricks as a medium, along with just the right amount of imagination, to create unique three-dimensional sculptures, models, portraits, and mosaics. His art is on exhibit now at the Heard Museum in Phoenix. Take a look. I enjoy making square things into round things. My name is Dave Shaddix. I'm, a, uh, I'm an artist. I work with Lego bricks. Uh, I guess the popular term is brick artist now. When I was a little kid, I played with Lego, of course. Uh, in fact, I remember my first set, oddly enough, like circa 1970 something. And by the time I was in eighth grade, my family, my parents, uh, my grandparents uh, who raised me, they, they talked me into getting rid of my Legos. I, I gave them away to a um, uh, less fortunate family. And then when I had my uh, first son, I started buying him Lego because I wanted to get him into Lego so I could get back in and start getting these cool Lego sets for myself. And by the time he was uh, old enough to really start playing with them, I was too. And um, I was kind of, you know, building spaceships on the floor and, and doing kind of, you know, just stuff that was cool, but I couldn't really share it openly with my friends because now here I am in my mid-30s building spaceships on my carpet, buying presents for my son and then taking them back away so I could play with them. And I realized this isn't cool for so many reasons. So I wanted to do something different. You know, I do some sculptures and uh, some lamps, stuff like that. I, I, I'm trying to lean more towards three-dimensional work right now, but um, uh, mosaics, portraits, things of that nature are, uh, are a lot of fun, and that seems to be the most requested pieces. My first commission, um, I am a huge, uh, not even a closet, it just, uh, just a huge Gilligan's Island fan. Uh, grew up watching it, loved the show. So I built the, uh, the radio from, from the show, the one that they always had that uh, was their only connection to the outside world. I'd had it for about a year and I get an email from a friend who was contacted by uh, somebody claiming to be, um, to represent David Copperfield. So I actually thought it was an elaborate joke. Turns out it was actually David Copperfield and he's a huge fan of Gilligan's Island. He purchased this piece that I'd already made. Uh, it was pretty cool. It had a little battery door in the back. You could put the batteries in, and, and I made a little coconut drink for it. Although you can't drink it. This is my studio. Uh, this is where I do all of my work, and these are, uh, I guess, the equivalent of my paints. Uh, this is where I keep all of my Lego brick, um, all sorted by, uh, by element and by color. Uh, so each one is just filled with that type of brick and that specific color. This, to me right now, seems to be a lot. I'm curious to see what a lot will be in another five years. Uh, and these are the base plates I use. This is, uh, I basically take these and we all play with these. Uh, I put uh, an adhesive on the back of it and then um, place them on a uh, sheet of MDF board uh, to basically create my canvas. Over here on the screen, uh, we have sort of a process. I, um, you know, find an image, something that I want, uh, something that I like, something that I find interesting and striking. In this case, it was uh, Batman. So then I take it and um, and I, I simplify it down a little bit. I, I do some, some changes in the colors. I, I bring the more grays into it. There's still a lot that's not going to uh, translate to Lego well, if at all. So I need to still make some, just some visual corrections here. Uh, you know, Robin's legs are the same color as the moon, uh, stuff like that, things that are just a little too faint. So, you know, now, now here we are in a, uh, uh, in, a, in a newer version. I've decided to go ahead and make the, the for contrast, made the moon orange. Uh, I've really bought these buildings, the skyline out. And then I've taken them all in the final stage. I've gone in now pixel by pixel and, and, and redrawn the whole thing.
to really give it that blockiness. So at this point, this is, uh, you know, 8-bit art. The Herd Museum contacted me, they approached me along with a few other artists, Native American artists, uh, to collaborate on this, uh, this exhibit. Well, this exhibit is another, provides another answer to the question, what is Native art? Uh, many people have an idea of what it is, some rely on some things they've seen from movies and television, others have actually visited galleries or have gone to Indian country. But uh, this, this exhibit shows how uh, Native artists can produce beautiful pieces in many different media. And one of those beautiful media is, is, are Lego bricks. Uh, one of the best examples is right behind me. Uh, just over my shoulder is a uh, uh, representation by Marlo Cotoni. Uh, he is a Navajo weaver. He created this weaving, this textile called Angry Birds Tree of Life, uh, where he mixed uh, some traditional forms with certainly a very modern form of Angry Birds. And uh, uh, this particular piece caught the eye of Dave Shaddix, uh, who uh, decided that it would make a great Lego brick art piece. And so um, we have just to the right of Marlo Cotoni's original weaving is a 57,344 piece Lego sculpture, or Lego mosaic, if you will, uh, that took about 60 or 70 volunteers uh, about an afternoon to assemble based on Dave's careful plotting of colors and, and images based on Marlo Cotoni's original work. The weaving of the textiles and the building of the mosaic, there, there does seem to be a lot of similarity. Um, I've actually kind of spoken with a few weavers, uh, Navajo weavers, and uh, because you know you see them and they're just working freehand. They're 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 putting these these intricate geometric patterns, um, and they're just weaving. And um, uh, yeah, they make mistakes and they'll go back and fix them and, and make new ones. Um, but there's a you know I've, I've asked them and they said it's just counting. It's just it's math, um, and they're doing all of this in their head. And, and there's a, a lot, you know, with, with a Lego, uh, a lot of similarity there. It's, uh, I mean, the Lego, you could, you could almost put it as a pixel, uh, but it's the same, the space between the, uh, uh, the in the weave, in the rug. Uh, it's the same thought, it's just a different application. You know, it's something that's universal. I mean, everyone on the planet seems to know what a Lego is. We've all stepped on one. Um, you know, we, we all have some sort of a story with Lego. And when people see the work, they say, oh my God, that's Lego. Wow, that's really cool. And then they, they tell their stories or share about their kids or their grandkids. And it, it's fun, it's, it's just this universal thing. To learn more, visit southwestbricks.com. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org artbeat, where you'll find feature videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Art Beat Nation is made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you.